In episode 117 I introduced my PoC cassette vision video modification, which builds on the groundwork that was laid by Japanese Moto MGN 3303. I said that I will put more research into that topic and today the moment has come. Additionally to my solutions for providing S-video, I am now capable to deliver YPBPR and composite video. After addressing the video modifications, I will elaborate on the general restoration of the console in this episode. In the past, I struggled with color accuracy. To have a reference of how the colors shall look like, I bought another cassette vision, with which I haven't messed yet, to record video from its original RF output. As Big Sports 12 isn't well documented in the internet still, I decided to acquire some more games, which allowed me comparisons against other sources. This is how my radio frequency recordings look like. The image is very bright and the colors have an almost pastel quality to them. Overall, the colors are reasonably close to the images on the packaging of the games. When looking at my inverted Luma signal through an oscilloscope, I wasn't happy with the positive offset. I suspected it could be the reason for my blue tinted black areas and my yellow tinted white areas. Within my research, I tried dozens of digital NPN transistors to figure out alternatives. Ironically, I wasn't able to find any better transistor than the C114 I was already using. C143EL transistors behave almost as well in this application. C124 transistors work well but yield in a smaller signal and thus don't have to be attenuated as harshly. An interesting candidate were 1201 transistors. Using these I don't get the bothersome offset, but sadly they aren't able to invert the C-Sync portion of the Luma signal because it clips too soon. Therefore I would need to build an attenuation step prior inversion and then, depending on signal levels, I would need to use a BC184 transistor to amplify the signal again. For the moment I stuck with C114 transistors. If I adjust all parameters correctly, I would argue that I am achieving a good result. For people who make cassette vision reference recordings using my mod, I would suggest fixing the residual color offsets in a video editing program in post-production. Of all the video output designs I came up with, I am the most pleased with the results of S-Video. As I already mentioned it in episode 117, you would use proper chroma as chroma, but depending on your monitor or capture device, you get away with using the chroma subcarrier, which is more readily accessible. If you want to output video as composite, chances are that the chroma levels are too low to stitch the two signals together via a capacitor. I ended up amplifying this signal using a BC184 transistor. Again, I screened all my digital NPNs and several common ones through my oscilloscope to find the best suited one for this application. As you can see, I am also amplifying an inherent 2.8 kHz parasite frequency that plagues the signal. I did not yet find the values to filter it out. A simple way to make composite video from Luma and Chroma is connecting them via a 470 picofarad capacitor as suggested by Tommy Engdahl in 1999. Here you can see the result. I am very pleased with the colors. As you would expect from composite video, the image is not very sharp and there is some flickering at the edges. Please remember that composite loses about 36% of quality because it mixes various signals. Still, it's about a 5% gain of quality compared to the RF output. To simplify my circuitry, I ended up always amplifying chroma and using it that way for S-Video 2. My S-Video output is noticeably sharper, while retaining the correct colors. Typically, just 4% of the quality is lost in S-Video, as this technique separates brightness, color and audio into distinct paths. The parasite signal from chroma is more prominent after amplification and is visible as diagonal ripples in my output. I am able to achieve an even better picture quality when outputting YPBPR, which carries two halves of the color information separately. Because I am not relying on the noisy chroma signal, 
This video output doesn't suffer off the ripples like the other outputs do. Overall I'm happy with my component output, but compared to the other three options it is a bit dark. This can be resolved by attenuating Luma less when going for YPVPR, but I decided to do such adjustments either on the monitor or in post-production after video capturing. Personally, I am more offended by the color accuracy, which here seems to be the worst among my three custom outputs. It has been postulated that one of the two color halves PB or PR were inverted on the cassette vision PCB, but I am able to falsify that claim. I am using the circuit as shown here, but if users wanted to chase for perfect color accuracy in the machine itself, one would install 0 to 100 ohms potentiometers instead of the 30 ohms resistors at the attenuator stages. Speaking of potentiometers, on the main board there is one which is labeled R13. It is accessible from the outside and is used to dial in color when outputting RF. For my custom video modifications, I ended up dialing it to 388 ohms. This adjustment has to be done while the console isn't powered. Setting R13 to extreme values will damage the C114 transistor. Also an unrelated warning, there is an adjustable inductor on the mainboard. Sticking common metal items, such as screwdrivers, into adjustable inductors will destroy them. Looking at my modified console, you can see video mode toggle switches. Depending on which video output combination you would like to implement, you would need them too, as some video outputs interfere with the others. If you use the Chroma subcarrier instead of Chroma, you can't use Chroma anymore for composite video. If you combine Luma and Chroma down the line to generate composite video, the quality of S video decreases. If you process PB and PR, as I have shown in the schematic diagram, you will offset the colors of Chroma. RF is also affected by the video outputs, but I did not attempt to figure out the dependencies. There is lots of misinformation on video signals, and it's a difficult topic to research for amateurs. Therefore, I went and made my own reference oscilloscope readings from a Panasonic DMR EH59 DVD player to use as a benchmark and vague guide. I did most of the development and most of the measurements on breadboards. It's a practice I can strongly recommend. I saw the wire ends to pin headers, which work great with breadboards, but also make a good permanent solution later on when using screw clamp terminals which fit nicely on prototyping boards. Personally, I always go for stripe boards rather than dot boards for my prototypes. I am happy about how my modifications turned out. They aren't perfect by any means, but I think they are a big leap into the right direction. I hope it helps to keep this fine little console relevant and persuades people to experience the Epoch Cassette Vision light gun. Because the gun is LDR based, it is of course compatible to modern screen technology when adjusting brightness or sensitivity. Besides further refinements to my video modifications, another project that came to my mind was to increase the library of available games. There were a slew of consoles, such as the Soundic Soundvision SD range, that used a similar but programmable chip of the same series as the cassette vision relied on. The chip was called MuPD 779C-300 and was also made by NEC. As is, it contained a game, but that game could be overridden by other games that were stored on ROM chips. Therefore, one could desolder the NEC chip from the console's mainboard and put it into a Game Genie-like device which would plug into the Epoch cassette version. When plugged in alone, it would be the standard sound version-like game, but when also connected to original ROM cartridges, it would offer these games instead. In this last segment, I would like to elaborate on the general restoration of the console. The face side potentiometers are 250 kilo ohms and have a D-shaped 6 mm thick and 18 mm long stem. Sadly, I wasn't able to source any direct replacement for them, and therefore I reconditioned the original ones. To do so, you would pry the metal tabs open with a prying tool. Never use flathead screwdrivers as a prying tool. Clean the patina from the metal contacts and the oxide from the carbon layer using a cotton swab which is soaked with propane tool. Try to be gentle but thorough. While the switches under the face buttons look Cherry MX compatible, in fact they just support MX keycaps that have a cut-through socket, as the crossbars are longer than in Cherry MX. 
I was able to identify the switches as SMK J-M0404 series. It thus shouldn't be a problem to find spare units, as these switches were also used in the keyboards of many BBC microcomputers. If users still prefer Jerry MX switches, they have to rely on stem risers or cut down keycaps, as Jerry MX stems aren't tall enough otherwise. Furthermore, some wire connections would have to be soldered, as the Jerry switches spot a different footprint. Personally, I replaced each electrolytic capacitor in the console and in every game with aluminium polymer capacitors. I use these for most of my projects. They are high quality and will never ever leak, as they are solid. Some of the solder pads of the capacitors are located beneath the metal RF shield, which thus has to be removed during the replacement. Each game cartridge contains two capacitors. This is the end of the video. My name is Ben. I thank you for viewing.